So it was a ways away from the 50th anniversary, but I was just realizing that I was a kid near NASA at that time. It was actually on my movie Boyhood, I had that year to think of each year, and I would think by grade, first grade, first grade. And I got to second grade and I said, oh wow, I was actually living near NASA. We walked on the moon that summer after second grade. And I was like, what, a, what an interesting time to be a kid. And I started just thinking of it. Like, oh, it'd be interesting to see it from like the kid family perspective, you know? like. If you think about it, 600 million people watched it on TV and only three people were on the mission and two walked on the moon. So it's like kind of a bottom-up version of such a momentous occasion. And history at the time, like the movie says, we thought, oh, we'd be on Mars by now, all this other stuff. But it, it gets even more impressive in, in retrospectively because we never got any better. You know, we never, <laughs> all that didn't happen. So it, it, it's even what we were taking for granted in front of us becomes an apex. It's not a lot of fields that you look back and they haven't, especially when it comes to technology and things, hasn't gotten bigger and better. <laughs> you know, it's kind of just sat there as this incredible engineering achievement. I uh, think the greatest in human history, hands down. And so I just thought it'd be funny to contrast such a huge momentous moment in history, something that, you know, a thousand years from now, they'll still talk about, oh, humans left the atmosphere and went to the moon for the first time. Who knows what we'll be doing by then? But it's a marker in evolution to contrast that with such mundane, like family watching TV, you know, just the life of a really ordinary uh, group of people who just happened to be located near, you know, near NASA at the time. So I don't know, those two contrasts were in my mind kind of a goofy childhood fantasy with the uh, facts of the, the the Apollo 11 mission, which I got to do a lot of research on. Started researching and, I don't know, thought about it for about eight or 10 years and finally wrote a script. And, you know, it's a long, long, it's a long gestation time. Actually, I spent more time thinking and to finish film than the entire Apollo program <laughs> from the inception to on the moon. So. I'm not comparing the efforts. <laughs> Just time wise. So your mom closes the film saying, you know how memory works, yeah. uh, because memory can be fluid. What do you remember? And do you remember not remembering certain things as well? Well, I do have, if I have one gift in this world, it's a pretty exacting memory. And, and I, I'll honestly admit, I was the kid falling asleep. I didn't see it like I'd fallen asleep. <laughs> But um, I, I think I've seen it a million times since him walking on the moon. You know, it, was, it was everywhere. So uh, that's how we all, you know, there's a cultural memory that invades our personal memories rather quickly, kind of instantaneously sometimes. Everybody here thinks they saw the second building on 9-11, right? Yeah. You were on the West Coast. It was like five in the morning. You didn't see it, but you saw it a million times over, so you think you saw it live, but you probably didn't. Do you consider this film? Do you but I'm not for instance, I'm just saying, we all, we were at that game, we were all, the, you know, so anyway, I, I just thought it was kind of funny that it's such a big build up, but because you kind of screwed around all day at us, you're probably, you know, you're a kid, you can't help it, you're falling asleep. Do you consider this film autobiographical, or is it more just memory springboarding into a story you want to tell? It's kind of a blend. I mean, we, I didn't go to the elementary school exact closest to NASA. That was the one in the movie a producer I worked with, Mike Blizzard, he went there, but I was a couple schools over in a little town called Friendswood. But uh, my dad didn't work at NASA, but a lot of friends' dads, you know, so it's a blend. I, I had two older sisters, but for a while I had some step siblings, so I had a, and another kid was living with us. So for a short while, I was in a family of, there were six kids and I was the youngest, so I remembered that. So it's kind of autobiographical and kind of, it's a, it's a blend, but you know, all that is uh, memories, you know? And then um, all the NASA stuff is, is really accurate, actually. You know, all those are, those are transcriptions and we're using actual, you know, voices, all the TV stuff. It's, it's Pretty obsessively exacting, actually. <laughs> if you were to get a TV guide from those four days, you will notice that the uh, 
Beverly Hillbillies episode is the exact right decision. You will notice that Janis Joplin is off being interviewed that night. If you will notice that Joni Mitchell is and is on Johnny Cash that night. Right. The monkeys are on. Yeah. Very exacting. Those four films are showing at the drive-in that night. So, I don't know. Might as well try to get it right. Um, you've made uh, animated films uh, before. My third animated film. What have you learned from Scanner Darkly and Waking Life that you used for this production? Yeah, uh, animation, my third decade now of animated movies, I've done three. Uh, it's been a wonderful little progression. First one was super, super <coughs> nice figuring out what we were doing. The second one, much more polished. This one, Tommy and I, uh, we knew we couldn't really go back. We felt on Scanner as a rotoscope movie, we kind of left it there. We started developing another process uh, probably about 10 years ago. I had a, I was um, maybe gonna make a film with Warner Brothers, this animated thing. It never happened, but we got some of that you know, development money and we were uh, kind of moving the process forward where we kept the rotoscoping and, and actually different. It's a different line gun. It's not interpolated, it, it's, it's a little different, but that's really all. Everything else is 2D. We called it like two and a half D. <laughs> you know, so it's like, it's kind of a mashup of techniques. It's 2D, 3D, uh, you know, the performance capture, we call it, and rotoscope. So that's just the outline of the, the humans, you know. <laughs> but uh, um, so I, I'd say that technique, we just pushed it a lot, much more forward, and, and this was a lot more fun, like, in a way more creative, you know, more imaginative, but that's why I wanted to do it animated in the first place, because it takes place in the, in the head, you know, it's kind of a fantasy memory kind of area, so, and the world we were recreating is long gone, you know, Astro World was torn down years ago, and, you know, it's this whole different world, so, not to mention all the outer space stuff, you know, so, I mean, that was just, the, the shoot was, you know, just on a green screen. It's like every shot we did live action is a special effect. <clears throat> we had the backgrounds all, you know, kind of to the inch planned out, but not built. We would build it after we had the movie and then post. So, you know, very tedious, many step process, but I like that. Um, a lot of heavy lifting is on Jack Black's shoulders as the narrator throughout as Stan. Yeah. Um, you worked with him on Bernie and on School of Rock. What did you talk to him about as far as who his Stan character is? What was his character to you? Yeah, exactly. Uh, Jack was just kind of tickled by the, the project, you know. I sh showed it to him and he just laughed a lot. He thought it was funny. And uh, I knew he could bring that humor to it. And, you know, he had personal reasons. You know, Jack's mom was a true rocket scientist. Person who you know, worked in Huntsville, Alabama, just had that um, very impressive. Uh, she, I mean, she she was a badass. You know, astronauts would the ones who were saved on Apollo 13 came and introduced themselves to her and thanked her for some of the things she worked out. That a couple years later saved them. So that's Jack's mom. Mm -hmm. So he always his family always had an attachment to this this time in history. Jack was just being born about this time. But uh, I don't know, for me, he represents kind of the adult perspective, my own perspective. I had my little second grade perspective on this. You know, I made the actors fourth grade because I just didn't want to work with kids that young. <laughs> fourth graders can still have a fantasy, right? Yeah, about that. That's about the end of childhood. So let's make it, I don't want to work with nine and 10 year olds, not seven and eight, you know. But uh, um, I thought the, the adult perspective was important. To, to mix in there, because you know you find there's the there's kind of a cultural critique. There's a certain knowingness. There's a certain perspective that is absent when you're a little kid, like, as it was for me. You know, I didn't. It never crossed my mind at that age, even though we were living in Houston. And my mom was at the around campus and the hippies and all that. I didn't get their politics. I didn't know that they were kind of against the the Apollo program. It was seen as this militaristic nationalistic Cold War exercise that it was, you know, 
kind of flexing them in a nationalistic way. And I, I didn't know what, and most important, just a, way, a waste of money that we could be using. You know, that's a fair conversation to have, right? At all times about what our government's spending money on. But uh, I think because it was so successful in its day, that, that critique sort of drifted away. Mm -hmm. But when I went back and did a lot of research, there it is, you know, there's Gloria Steinem. <laughs> There was a Kurt Vonnegut clip. He was he was on TV that night, just crapping all over the whole thing. It was really funny. You can find it on YouTube. 